Hey YouTubers, I am your host Tony Merkel and I want to let you know that we are a podcast first which means we upload our shows to YouTube. If you really like the show and you want to hear it on the go whether you're at the gym or in the car driving around go to iTunes and hit subscribe. And if you're not on iTunes, no problem. Go to iHeartRadio, Spotify or your favorite podcast player, hit subscribe and you can listen to us that way as well. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. Let's get to it. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. And if you're interested in having some extra content every week, we do have memberships on the website, and memberships will get you an extra episode every Thursday on theconfessionalspodcast.com. Just go to the website, hit the join button, and become a member today. And if you haven't done so yet, you can join the first in line text message community. What you do is you text the word YUP, Y U P, to 844 215 0819. That's 844 215 0819 and you'll get all the first in line text message updates that i offer to the first in line community so go ahead and do that today it is free for you to do so it doesn't cost you a dime now this week we have michael and jessica coming on the show they are engaged and they experience paranormal activity together and separately first up we're going to have michael on the show sharing experiences that he's had since he's been a kid including being followed throughout his life by this incubus that has been attacking him and then we're going to have jessica on the show and she's going to talk about things that she's experienced with Michael and separately. So it's going to be a great show this week. And let me tell you, this coming Thursday show, we have a returning guest that's a fan favorite. Brian from episode 31, I Killed Bigfoot, is coming on the show this coming Thursday for the members only episode. So let's listen to the members episode trailer featuring Brian this coming Thursday on the confessionalspodcast.com. Let's go. So you have this situation where you actually have active Bigfoot in the area. Uh, you take one down, the body goes missing, and uh, you tried contacting some people to no avail. Nobody really helps you, but uh, some people show up and uh, question you about what happened. So what they say? I mean, they, they show they show up at your property and stuff, and they yeah. they question you about Bigfoot. What was the deal? They showed me they showed me a federal ID that they worked for the F like the federal 
something. And they said, all right, where's the body, stupid? I was like, well, come in and I'll show you what happened. I took him up there with flashlights and I was like, well, here's where I was. This is what I was doing. It got too close and I landed on it. And if you don't like it, oh well. And they was like, well, where's the body? And I said, well, see them jack marks on top of that hill? It's back in there somewhere. If you want to go back there all by yourself and get it, fuck yourself out. And they took hair and they took blood samples and they said, don't ever do it again. It's a federal protected animal. You will go to jail in a federal prison. You got it? I said, okay, understand. And they just left. Just left. Just left. All right, today we have a great guest coming on. We have Michael. Michael, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Tony. How are you tonight? I'm doing good, dude. I'm doing good. So uh, your experiences that you're going to be sharing tonight have me very excited and interested to hear. I know, obviously, it's not exciting to go through some of these things, but as, <laughs> no. a, as a consumer of your story, I'm very interested in hearing about it. And so you've had a lot of different paranormal things happen to you throughout your life, but it all kicks off with a near-death experience that you had as a kid. And so if you could just talk to us and walk us into what happened, how it happened, what happened, and then Talk to us and, and walk us through the you know the progression of these things as how you experience other things after this near death experience. Absolutely, and feel free to stop me if you have any questions because I tend to ramble sometimes. Sounds good, sir. Um, gosh, it started when I was four years old, and it's something I'll never forget. Even just talking about it makes me. <laughs> It's kind of heavy to talk about it. My parents had a, a set of friends that had a, a lake house in Lake Delton in Wisconsin Dells. And we would go to that lake house every summer as a summer vacation thing. And we did that for about 10 years. And to this day, I don't know how to swim. And it's because of what I experienced. My family friends were there and they had those, you know, those pool noodle things, the the orange, yellow, those things that you kind of hang on to when you're yeah. swimming. Yeah, I I thought that I was going to get one of those things. So they were playing with them, and my friend's son said, hey, go catch one of these things. So being a four-year-old and not knowing any better, I jumped off the end of the pier to go get one of those things, and that choice has changed my whole life. Um, I don't... I don't know what else to explain this as other than what I saw. And I've told it to several people and some people say to me, yeah, that's real man. And some people say, no man, that's, that's crazy. But I know it was real. I fell into the lake and saw what now I can only ascribe to be God, a light that was so peaceful, so loving, so encompassing. And I was swimming towards it, and all around me were sea creatures, turtles, whales, sharks, fish, all going towards this light. And I didn't want to leave. When I, I don't know what picked me out of it. I, I felt something grab my leg, and I was at the front of the beach. And my mother came running out and scared and she grabbed me and picked me up and my legs were completely wrapped in seaweed. So whatever it was had wrapped me up in seaweed and I was experiencing something I've never experienced before. And I've always wanted to go back. And when I was picked up by my mother, I was crying and said, mommy, 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 I want to go back. I don't want to stay here. I want to go back into the light. I want to go back. That was also the same time that I lost my color vision. I used to have a full spectrum color vision and that seeing that light was the last time I ever saw green or blue in my whole life. And it's also when these things started. <sighs> Sorry. No, it's fine. Yeah. Do you want to keep going or, or you need a minute? I'm good. Okay. I'll, uh, keep pushing through it because this, this next one is probably the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced when it comes to all these things. 
I was, uh, I went home. My mom cleaned me up from the bath and we went home. And the first night I was at home was when I had this experience, which was the start of all my other paranormal experiences. Something in part of me wants to know what these types of demons are, but at the same time, putting a name to them is probably not the best thing. So I fell asleep and had a dream that I could remember vividly. In that dream, I was at my grandmother's house and she had ordered pizzas. Waiting for the pizzas to arrive, she said, just when the doorbell rings, go get the pizzas, here's the money. I got the, the money and the doorbell rang. I opened the door and have you ever seen the movie uh, Cujo, but that crazy killer dog? You know what? Of all the movies that I haven't seen, I do think I've seen that one. That was a very similar, I think it was a St. Bernard. It was uh, in the dream, the dog, when I opened the door, a dog killed me. I was mauled to death. And maybe what seemed like 30 seconds later in the dream, it's a dream, it's hard to quantify, but I saw my gravestone, I saw my own funeral, and I woke up absolutely terrified. Mind you, I'm a four-year-old seeing all these things. And when I woke up and I looked towards my bedroom, if you could picture the bedroom, my there's a window to the left, which we'll get back to this later. And then my bed is right next to the window on that wall. And then there's a wall in front, a wall in the back. And then to the right, where you would enter would be the doorway. So standing in the doorway was really all I could describe it to be is a demon. It had a lower body of a horse basically it had long brown fur long legs there were hooves and i could see through its legs that it had a forked tail at the back its upper body was something that i could describe to be a huge mr galaxy bodybuilder type that was completely red and <laughs> This is almost as hard as the other thing, the piercing eyes. I'll never forget those eyes. They were gold. They looked right through me. I felt like it was looking through me, and the eyes had slits like a... It was almost like it was a snake. They were big golden eyes, and I was petrified. And it wasn't until maybe five or ten seconds later that I felt myself breathing and i saw that it was cold the room was cold i got the courage to get up and i got up after it walked away and i ran to see where it went down the hallway and i looked to my right down the hallway and i heard the hooves on the hardwood linoleum floor but i didn't see anything it walked down the hallway and disappeared and that's that's where really everything else came from is that moment. Wow. So you were, I think you said, what, five years old when this happened? I was four. So you were four when you saw this demon and when you had the near-death experience. Yeah, because we went on vacation and we came home from vacation. And it was that night that we had gotten home from vacation I that I had the first experience. So you actually had that experience with the demon very, very close in time to when the near death death experience happened. I'd say probably a two a day or two at the most later. Yeah. Wow. So w when you're four years old and you're seeing this, by the way, it sounds like a centaur, don't you think? To me, it does. Yeah. Um, it's it's something. The only thing I could uh, I could liken it to is I play lots of video games, and if anybody in the audience has heard of the game series Doom, there is a character called a Cyber Demon. And it's got a red body and a lower body is just like that. It looks almost identical to that. So you had this experience with this thing, but it was actually something that was very physical, wasn't it? I mean, you heard it running th across the hardwood floor. This isn't something that was like a, like at least 100% a spiritual entity because it actually left its marking of audio when it was running across the hardwood floor. Yeah, it, it it wasn't really running. It was more like walking, but 
it definitely it turned around and I saw the fork tail go to the right down the hallway and I heard walking like like a horse, like walking down the hallway. And I heard distinctly, I don't know how many hoof steps, but it was definitely hooves for sure. How big was this thing? I mean, were we talking like the size of the room or, you know, four feet high? How tall was this? It took up, uh, if you could imagine a standard door frame, my house's doors were about seven and a half feet tall. It took up the whole door frame. It looked like the, the top half literally looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was Mr. Galaxy, like just that jacked, that huge. It was absolutely massive. I'd say probably across had to be at least shoulder to shoulder, four feet across. It was massive. Wow. And so it was, it was huge and it had glowing gold eyes, you said, right? In a fork tail? It had a fork tail, glowing gold eyes, and the eyes looked like a snake. Like they had, I don't know how else to describe it than that. They looked like a snake. Jeez, man, that sounds terrifying, especially for a four-year-old to see that. I mean, so... You see this thing happen. Uh, you tell your parents, I'm assuming, right? The, yeah, I, I don't remember how long ago it was after that, but I told my parents, and I'd like to think this is probably something I'm going to do when I become a parent, but I told them about it, and they're like, oh, no, you know, you were just having a bad dream. It was just, you know, you just, you're not feeling well. You're just having a bad dream. It was just a nightmare. Don't worry about it. We don't have any bad things in this house. There's no, no, I thought something was out to get me as a kid. I didn't know what else to think. And that same night I ran into my parents' bedroom. I can laugh about it now, but I ran into my parents' bedroom and I'm like, mommy, daddy, there's a big red demon. He's trying to get me. And I was terrified, but (laughs) They were just all dismissive, like, I guess it might be a good thing to just, you know, you don't want to say to your kid, yeah, it was a demon. Yeah, you know, right. it, it was probably trying to get you because not a good idea. Yeah, and and that's one of the things that, you know, dealing with what I deal with and stuff. I mean, I, I think about those kind of things with my son. You know, I, I've seen things when I was a kid. I, I, I don't think I've ever even told this story on the show because it's not really show worthy. But I remember when I was a kid laying in bed and seeing this shadow on my ceiling in a, in a, like a human form, but it was only the upper half of the shadow and it was moving back and forth for forever. And I just was staring at this thing and I was scared of it, but I didn't know what to do. And it went away yeah. and I didn't tell my parents and I don't know why I just didn't, I didn't tell my parents. And it's one of those things where kids, sometimes they don't tell their parents, but uh, I really hope that if my son ever comes to me and says, I saw this, I would take it serious. And I think I would. Uh, what I'm going to tell him, I think will vary on how old he actually is. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's not It's not like I'm going to be telling my three-year-old, hey, son, I just want to let you know, monsters are real. You know? <laughs> that's, yeah. It's probably Bigfoot not the- is real. Yeah. Demons are real. They don't like you. They're not friendly forest giants. You know? Right. So, uh I do find it fascinating though, because uh, the, what I'll call it is a centaur, because I don't know what else to call it. I mean, a demonic entity, yeah, uh, centaur, demonic entity. Uh, I've heard of people seeing these things before, not a whole lot, but I have heard stories of people seeing these centaurs. And are they demonic? I don't know. But for you, what you saw was acting paranormal in the sense that it had glowing eyes and it had obviously a different type of body than what we're used to seeing, but it was also yeah. very physical. And that's what I find very interesting because the other encounters that I've heard of these things, everybody points to that these things actually looked very physical. And it takes you right back to this element of what are these cryptids? You know what I mean? And are they just physical creatures or are they demonic entities? You know, same thing with Dogman. People say that, you know, they, they were chased out of the woods by a dog man. And at the same time, you hear other people say that they had a dog visit them in their room. And it was more of like a demonic experience, but it was a dog. And so it just makes you yeah. wonder what's going on here. Uh, so you had that experience. You tell your parents. Uh, I'm assuming that's the first and last time you ever saw that, right? It was the very last time I saw it. But just, just my a connection I just made right now when you said the dog in your room. It's kind of interesting that the dream I had was a dog killing me. 
and then I had the experience of that demon right after I, when I woke up. It's just my brain making a connection. I don't know if it's there or it's not there, but... Well, I think that it's a, a, a very solid connection because I've been getting a lot of different stories, not just from people contacting me, but I hear things on other shows and radio shows and things like that, where people are talking about experiencing this dog-like entity that is coming to them in their sleep, at night in their rooms. It, sometimes it's on four legs. Sometimes it do, it's on two legs. Sometimes it has glowing red eyes. Sometimes it acts more human-like, but it's this dog-like entity that people are experiencing. And it makes you wonder, is this dog man? Is dog man a more demonic entity? Uh, I, I don't know, yeah. but that's a, that's a very interesting connection that you just made. Definitely. And my personal belief is Nephilim, but that's a whole nother can of worms right there. Yeah, I think everybody knows my feeling on that. So, uh, Michael, you had that experience, but that's not the last experience you had. Uh, talk to us about the lanky man that you saw. This one is the most peculiar, I have to say. Um, as I said earlier, I'm an, an avid gamer, and I also said to remember the window. I had an experience with this thing three times. It was night after night after night, so three nights in a row. We'll just say, for example, say Monday. Monday evening, I'm sleeping in my bedroom, and anytime I had any experiences with these things, it was always at the exact same time every time. It was always 3.23 in the morning every time. And I would wake up at 3.23 and would experience something, and to this day, I still do. I looked at my dresser, and I saw it was an emaciated figure just looked like not even skin. Like if you can imagine bones and just a little bit of skin, but it was also a translucent color. That was only thing I could describe it is if you, if you look at gasoline on something or on the ground, it kind of makes that like purpley rainbow type of a color on it. I don't know if that helps, but that's what it looked like. And I said to it, I said out loud, I'm like, hey. And when I said that, it turned around. And when it looked at me, where its head was, there was no face. It had a head, but there was no face. And when I said, hey, it jumped out the window. And I thought, huh. Boy, that's weird. Things don't just jump out windows. <laughs> then I would say so. <laughs> the next night, I woke up again, 323, and I looked at it, but I didn't say hey at first. I just kind of watched it, and it had my headset. I had one of those Turtle Beach headsets, and it was plugged into my Xbox that I had left running, and it was just holding this headset in the air and looking at it. And it makes my brain think of if it's some sort of a connection with electricity, because I watched a lot of ghost shows, I'm not sure. But it was drawn to it. And I've had several other experiences where they're drawn to my cell phone or they're drawn to a video game controller or anything that has electricity. But getting back to the lanky guy, eventually, after about five minutes, I said, I could see you there. Hello. And when I said hello, it turned around and stared at me. It cocked its head to the right, dropped the headset, and jumped out the window. I went back to sleep. The very next day was the last day I saw this. And again, 323. It's sitting there. But this time, it wasn't holding a headset. It wasn't looking at things on my dresser. It was at the edge of my bed staring at me and because these things don't scare me i said i can see you i know you're there you must be looking for something i if you're looking for acknowledgement that you're gone that you've passed i acknowledge that you're here i acknowledge that i see you if you're struggling to get to the other side i i i'm here it's okay to go if you want to go and after I said that, it faded and disappeared, and I never saw it again. So you think that you helped it transition? 
I honestly do. I really do. Yes. And this entity, it didn't have a face, right? No, no face. It had a, a completely bald head and no face. Where the face was, it was just gone. How large are we talking about here? Again, I mean, we talked about the centaur, you know, being about seven feet tall. Are we talking about an abnormally large thing or just like a normal size humanoid figure? I'd say probably like five feet, maybe five foot four at the most. It was a normal sized person. I'd say it was a man, but that's just what I ascribe it to. I didn't see any actual features. So how old were you? When this happened, this happened when I was in high school. It was about when I was 15. So you're 15 years old. You see this thing three different times at 323 in the morning, and you're not scared. No. (laughs) I'm not scared because I had grown up. I mean, there's so many experiences. This could be a four hour show. I grew up and I experienced so many things. Uh, One, I could tell you just to transition a little bit was something that I now know because I've researched this to be a hat man. Um, I had a chair next to my bed that I would use to play video games and I rolled over and again, 323. If I were to play the lottery, that's the number I would use. Um, And this hat man was sitting on the chair. It was looking at me. And it had a dog with it. Which, again, this dog keeps coming back to me. I don't understand it. But it was a small, like a Scottish Terrier type dog. And it looked over to me and said, we're watching you. We see you. And that one happened when I was about seven or eight years old. I can't pinpoint the exact date, but that was just one of many times. And I've seen the hat man a lot of times in my life. And every time I see it, it says that it's watching me, but it's never done anything bad. And everything else I've heard about the hat man is bad. Not always. Not always. No, no. Uh, With hat man, it's one, it's one extreme or the other. Uh, There's a lot of people that, share pleasurable experiences they don't they're not scared it's not trying to scare them but it's very very much there and then there's other people's experiences that they're they're petrified of this and uh it it acts in a way that scares them uh my wife Lindsay's one of them she saw a hat man when she was younger a little girl and she was terrified and so it not always is it uh, something that is going to scare you or try to scare you. Uh, but it's a very real phenomena that people are experiencing. I wanted to ask you, uh, mm-hmm. coming back to the the time, 323. Now, I'm not somebody who does a lot of calculating and numbers and things like that. I mean, I, li- I, I listen to it. I think there, there's definitely you know something to it sometimes. But when you said 323 three times, uh, it, it it starts to develop a pattern in your head. And, you know, it could be a stretch. By all means, it probably is a stretch. But I do find it interesting that, you know, three times two is six. And then two yeah. times three is six. And if you take three and three add together, it's six. And you've had these experiences at 323 in the morning, uh, which is the witching hour. And you put all that together, yep. and it's just like very interesting. Yeah, 666, number of the beast. Trust me, I've made that connection. You've been before, seeing a lot of beasts recently. To. Yeah. So, uh, with those experiences you've had and stuff up to this point, uh, your I guess your idea and w- the way you've been feeling about it is that it's happening so much in your life that you're really not getting scared at this point. Not anymore. Um, a lot of the time, it there's definite differences. There's for sure differences like the hat man is not a problem there's one that's in my life right now and when we get on the show again my fiance and i talk it's a little girl two little girls that talk and they're just talking in the next room but they're never anything bad but the interesting thing is every time they talk my dad the only time i ever told this story i've told it to you obviously in the audience my fiance and my dad He told me one time after I told him all these things that from time to time in my old house, he would see a little girl in a sundress that would point to my bedroom and say, it's dangerous. Don't go in there. So it's almost like these little girls are pointing out that the bedroom is dangerous. And 
my fiance could get more into that when she talks, but they're not always bad. But I can't imagine that the the centaur, we could just call it, is anything good because it made the room cold. It scared me to death and it just didn't have any good intentions. But I also think that we are given the gift of discernment spiritually. I believe it comes from God. And more and more, I'm thinking that the purpose of why I was saved is something, the thing that saved me, I don't know if it was an angel or it was God, but that hand that grabbed me and pulled me out saved me because I could see these things. And what drew me to come on your show today, Tony, and what drew me to even talk about it was just wanting to let people know that they're not alone and these things are real. These things happen. And everything always runs at the name of Jesus, which I could get into a little bit, bit later. But like the lanky man, I think that was just a lost soul that just needed acknowledgement that they were gone because he was fiddling with things and looking for something. But the third time, it was almost like I can imagine it was sitting there waiting for me to wake up and waiting for me to see it because it wasn't afraid of me anymore. So I, I kind of left kind of scattershot all over the place, but it's tough to say for sure. Yeah. And I mean, the, as far as the centaur goes, you know, every time I've heard of a centaur, it, it wasn't a great experience. I, I, I can't even think of a time that I've heard of somebody's encounter with one of these things that it was a good experience. Even the, the Disney cartoon Hercules, the big, the big mean centaur and stuff was a bad guy, you know, like the centaur is just bad guys. So uh, let me ask you here. You've had the demonic experience with the centaur. You had the lanky man. That's what we'll just call him, the lanky man. Uh, you've had the hat man experience, which is still an ongoing thing in your life. Uh, but you, you have an experience here with an imp, right? That one was just as scary as the, the, the centaur. Yeah, I think it's an imp. I, I, it's either that or a gin. I'm not sure. I'm not a demonologist and don't ever want to be, but I was sleeping on my bed and I woke up again, magic time, 323. And I rolled over, which to this day is the reason why when I sleep, I will never face away from the door or face the wall because of this experience. I rolled over and sitting on top of me was what I could only really describe as an imp or a gin. It had green scaly skin. It was sitting right on top of me. And its eyes were red. But I could definitely remember the ears. The ears were pointed back and upwards. But the whole thing looked all, honestly, like a reptile. It had green, scaly skin. It was sitting on top of me. And it, I don't know if it's an imp, more so that it might be a succubi. I'm sure you're, you've heard of that before. Yeah because it was trying to mount me and I'll just leave it at that. So that scared me really bad. And I still remember it and I'm still scared of it and I don't want to see it again. The eyes were just red. If you could imagine a red bounce ball sized eyes, they were just glowing red. It's teeth. When it grinned at me, it's teeth looked like, razors like really thin jagged razors and when it tried to mount me i just ran off the bed i rolled off the bed and ran into the the front room and watched perfect brownie pan infomercials the rest of the night because <laughs> I didn't sleep. wow man did it have horns no the ears were like just in the back, and then the left sides of its head, and the ears were, were definitely pointy and facing upward, but it didn't have horns, no. Okay. Uh, so it had like scaly skin. It, I'm assuming it was a humanoid figure. It had like humanoid shape to it, right? It was, it had legs. Yeah, it had legs. It had the, the arms, the, the face definitely looked re- 
like a reptile. It looked like a kind of like a creature from the Black Lagoon type thing. And its height was very small, which is why I think it was an imp or a gin. And the only reason why I attached succubi to it is because it tried to mount me, but its, its, size, its size was probably like two feet tall at the most. It was very small. You know, man, so you've had these experiences up to this point. I know we're not done here. In fact, I know we're not going to cover everything on the show today, but no, what you experienced as a child, four years old, you fell into this lake. You see these sea creatures in a lake, which is odd in itself. Uh, you see, yeah. you see a light, and you're at peace. Somebody or something pulls you out of the lake. You're wrapped in sea uh, seaweed, and you want to go back to the light. Do you think I do. at that? Okay, so you still do. So, yeah. <laughs> so, do you think that that moment in time where you had that experience and all that stuff happened to you almost sent out a signal to, I don't know, the universe, but like it, it made you uh, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, made you, it made you very visible. It made you very visible yeah. to an unseen realm that maybe wouldn't have had such vision for you if that experience didn't happen. I agree completely, and I think it was actually the the light of God that I saw, and the veil between the worlds was just that small glimpse of seeing it. I don't want to say marked, because that's not really a good idea, it's a good term, but I lost some of my vision because of it. So it was a significant thing that I've gone to eye doctors for, and they're like, this doesn't make any sense. You should be able to see all the colors. and no offense to doctors, but it was a supernatural thing. It was a spiritual thing that is not really attributed to that. But yeah, I do. I've always believed that I'm, for lack of a better phrase, that I'm marked, that they know that I've been there and I've seen that. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. You know, there's like, you know, when you're dealing with spiritual things or, you know, paranormal type things, people talk about how you could do something or something could happen to you that actually puts a target on you as far as being able to be more susceptible to these experiences that you're having. And it sounds like that's what you're, what, what it sounds like to you too, right? Most definitely. That experience has profoundly changed my life. And the only thing I could describe it to you that I even came close to it was when I was baptized in Christ. That same love I saw from that light was the same I felt when I was baptized, and I've never felt it since. So, yeah, I, I mean, this changed your life profoundly before your yeah. your life even began. I mean, you're four years old. In fact, one of my yeah. one of my earliest memories in my life is when I was four years old. I had a, bir- a surprise birthday party. I didn't even know it was my birthday because I was like a, a dumb kid. I'm four years old. And I didn't even know it was my own birthday. And they, they gave me a surprise birthday party at my apartment that I lived in when I was real little. That's one of my earliest memories I have. And at that age, this experience happened to you. You remember all the details of it, but also that transitioned your life trajectory into a whole new direction. That's fascinating. Completely. Yeah. So, I mean, with with these experiences you've had and stuff, and obviously uh, you've mentioned it several times in the show, your faith in Christ and things like that, uh, obviously that brings in a whole new element to what you've experienced and what you are going to be experiencing or what you're experiencing now. Uh, but before we even touch on that, uh, why don't you talk to us about some of these other experiences you've had where you're being scratched, you're being thrown across the room. I mean, these are some serious things that are still happening to you or happen to you? Yes. These are, are these types of experiences where they manifested, but they weren't visible is the best way I could describe it. The first one that happened was when I was 15 or 16 years old. And I've been told by doctors that it's sleep paralysis. But when I tell them sleep paralysis doesn't have actual cuts, that go down your back and your legs and your chest, right? And they're like, well, sometimes it does if you fall out of bed. But I didn't fall out of bed. I was held down by something that held my throat down to the the bed. 
it breathed on me really, really cold breath. I felt almost like it licked me. It was definitely on top of me. And it said to me, there's nothing you could do to get rid of me. I'm stuck with you forever. And when I tried to move, it scratched my back. It scratched my chest and my legs and all of them. Gosh, this makes me think of the 323 again. I had three claw marks on my back, three on my chest and three on my leg. Michael, and right, I never put that together. Michael, right before you said that, I wrote down three scratches. I knew you were going to say that, man. Really? 100% my sister sitting here listening to this interview and she watched me do it. I knew you were going to say three scat- scratches because three is the number that's been following you throughout these experiences. Yes, it is. What do you think that was? Because to me, it sounds awfully, uh, at least in nature, not visibly, but in nature, what you experienced with the imp. I think that's what it is. And that probably is what it did eventually because when it mounted me was the first time I actually physically saw it, but it's scratched me and thrown me off of my bed before I actually saw it. It probably happened at least 10 times at least. And every time it did it, it always said to me the same thing that you can never get rid of me and I'll never leave you. That type of, of jargon and lingo. More and more, I'm thinking it probably is. It probably was, I should say. So when you saw the imp, it said something similar like that to you when it was manifested physically? It didn't say anything to me. It just tried to mount me. And it I don't know if I said this earlier. It licked me. And I felt it lick me. Like, actually lick my back. It licked me. So was this a... A male entity? Yes, most definitely. Every time I've heard it talk to me, it's male. And it's always physically holding me down. It's trying to... The only way I could say it is it's trying to violate me. And I'm not a a small person. I'm like 400 pounds. It's not easy to move me or to throw me or anything me. So... It's done things to me like I'm just a rag doll, like I'm a child's toy, like I'm nothing. Yeah, well, why don't you describe some of those experiences you've had where you actually were physically thrown? Yeah, it's, it's when it was not paralysis, I would wake up and go to the bathroom or wake up and roll over. And it would always, like, it was playing these, these the only thing I could describe it to be games with me. It would, if I rolled over to the left, it would push me over and knock me off the bed to the right. If I got up to go to the bathroom, when I came back, it would slam the door in my face. If I went to sleep on the couch, it would, usually when I would sleep on the couch, since there wasn't really any room for me to move around, usually it would poke me until I woke up. And of course, when I wake up, it's 323 and there's nothing there. And of the times that it threw me off, the one that is the most profound, other than the times where it picked me off the bed and was playing games with me, was it happened right before I was saved. And it was when I was starting to get into the faith, when I would read my Bible every night, and it threw me off of the bed. I slammed my head into my dresser, which really, really hurt. And I rolled over. And when I rolled over, it said to me, angrily, like screaming at me. And when I say screaming and when I say these words, I hear these things in my head. I don't, you know, I don't hear them out loud. But anyway, it said that to me. And I said, You know, I roll over and I just try to ignore it. And it said, I'm not going away. You can never get rid of me. I'm always going to be here. So because I was a newly found Christian, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get the Bible and talk about Jesus. So I grabbed my Bible and I picked it up. But I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. 
in my infancy of being a Christian, it knocked the Bible out of my hands and screamed at me and said, that book has no power over me. And I picked it up and I said, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to leave. And I ask you, Jesus, to take him, take this thing anywhere you wish to take it. And when I said that, it screamed at me again. Now, screaming, mind you, is not a scream of a man. It's kind of like it has almost like a vibrato behind it. It's not human. Whatever it is, is it's not, it's not human. It, it definitely is evil. And again, I said, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to leave me at once. And finally, it left me. And that was the last time I ever experienced this thing, ever. So there's an obvious connection there. And it's absolutely bizarre because it's always things that I hear in my head. But the one thing that I never had any other time was I never had any other types of hallucinations. The the doctors told me it was. I didn't have anything else. It was always taunting. It was always attacking me. It physically hurt me. It physically threw me off my bed. It it was always a physical thing with it. So I I don't know. I don't know. Again, I rambled like I told you I would. No, it's fine, man. It's fine. I mean, I understand. If I experienced these kind of things, I would probably be rambling too. I'd still be stuttering and drooling on myself. So, I mean, I totally understand, yeah. man. Uh, you know, one thing that you're describing here when it comes to this succubus that you said you experienced, and I, I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong on this. Absolutely. But uh, it sounds more like an incubus to me because an incubus seems to be more of a male form and not a female form. And so, because that's what the succubus is. A succubus is more of a, of a female form coming to you. And uh, this thing was trying to mount you. And you said that it was more of a, of a male. Uh, have you, I mean, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you've looked into this. What was your reasoning for concluding that it's a succubus over an incubus? I've never heard the term incubus other than a rock band from the 90s. Okay. See, I thought, I just assumed that you knew the difference between the two. An incubus. Uh, no. An incubus is a demon that comes to you in a male form, and the succubus comes to you in a female form. And uh, so it sounds like more like you've had an experience with an incubus. And yes. the incubus, like if you just look on, how well, maybe you don't want to look online, but if you look nope. online at some of these pictures and stuff, uh, some of these like, like artwork it's more like artwork it's not like computer generated it's more like paintings and things like that of like demonic entities i don't know if they're old pictures and stuff some of them might be from the 1800s actually so some of these pictures that you see though i I remember one particularly was like a green looking incubus sitting on the back of somebody with its butt on their chest and its its legs up at its chest and it was like green and it had pointy ears it sounds a lot like what you experienced Exactly what it also makes me want to look into it, <laughs> but that's exactly that's exactly what it is. It, it, it it's exactly what it sounds like. I can't say it's exactly what it is because I don't know, but it sounds exactly like that. It's almost exactly to the T of what it is. If you want, I can actually send you the picture so you can look at it real quick. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I'll I'll look at it. You sure? Yes. Okay, I'm going to send it to you right now, and let me know what you think of it. Hold on. That is exactly it. That is exactly what tormented me all these years. The only difference is the eyes were red. Other than that, it's exactly the same. The pointy ears, the face, the size. The skin, all of it. I've never, I mean, I've seen it. It's been on top of me, but I've never seen that picture before. Yeah, there's there's a lot of pictures like that around the internet and stuff. It, and, you know, search at your own risk and stuff. But that's what it sounded yeah. like to me when you were talking about it. And I figured I would, uh, you know, send it over to you if you wanted me to because... 
you know, I think knowledge is power in these kind of situations. And the more you're informed on something, the more you know how to go about it. And to me, it definitely sounded like you were dealing with more of an incubus than a succubus. And it's it's actually freeing to see something like that because you said this is an old painting. It's definitely not like a computer generated image or something. It, it shows me that it's almost validation that I'm not the only one who's dealt with this. And it's something that people have dealt with for at least a hundred years, 200 years ago. As, as I don't know when this painting was done, but it's definitely not a, you know, it's not a newly done thing. I don't think, I don't know, but it's validation that it's happened to others. I mean, it's, it sucks that it's happened to others. It's nothing I want anyone to ever experience, but there's solidarity in knowing that I'm not alone, that other people have dealt with this. And right. it's terrifying. It really is. Yeah. You know, it's definitely something that you're not alone in dealing with. And incubus and succubus have been talked about throughout history. And a lot of people say it's mythology and things like that. But there are people who are experiencing these things. And again, where do you turn to figure out what's going on with you when you have these experiences? It's not like you can go to your school counselor when you're a kid. It's not like you can go to any therapist that's going to say you're not crazy. You know, I mean, what do you do when you have these experiences? And uh, I, I feel for you, man, because if I had that experience and I looked at something like that and it was trying to sexually assault me, I, I, I would be, I don't know how I would handle it. It sounds very scarring, to be honest with you. Uh, it is. It, it like makes you feel like you're just nothing. Like you're, like I said, it made me feel like I was a child toy. I mean, try picking up a 400 pound guy and throwing them across the room like they're nothing. I mean, and it's so small too. Not a big thing. It's a small thing. So. Yeah. You know, and the incubus band that you reference and stuff, that, that band is one reason why I don't listen to that band. Uh, when I found out what an incubus was, I stopped listening because I liked the music. But once I found out what an incubus was, I, and this is years ago. I was just like, you know, there might be a reason why they named their band Incubus and I probably shouldn't be listening to it. <laughs> and so I think nope. I was, that was probably like 20 years ago when I found out what Incubus was. And I was just like, I swore that band off. And uh, I had a roommate in college who loved that band and would play that band all the time. And I told him, I said, I don't want that band playing in my room, man. Like do it in your car, put your headphones on, but I don't want that stuff blazing in my room. Because I, I knew what an incubus was. And he knew what an incubus was too, but he didn't care. So, uh, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Yeah. But man, you've had these experiences and I definitely, I definitely don't envy you at all for these experiences. I mean, sometimes I walk away from an interview and I'm like, man, that was a really cool experience. I would love to see a Bigfoot one day. You know what I mean? But what, you're, <laughs> what, you, what you experience and stuff is um, on another level. Because for most of these experiences, most of them, uh, you were in one way or another being attacked, not like maybe physically every time, but sometimes mentally or just playing with your psyche. I mean, the, these things that you've experienced, I don't envy at all, man. And I, I really, I really hope that most of this stuff is done in your life because like you said, you, you claim Jesus Christ over it and you um, rebuked it in the name of Jesus and this thing left. I hope that it's done. I hope that this thing doesn't come back on you. I don't think so. I've. We will get into this a little bit more when we when we do when we have my fiance tell her experience. But the very very last thing, and you could cut me if we're you know if it's going too far here or too long. But no, go ahead. This is the most profound thing that I've had an experience, and this is what completely changed me, and it's what delivered me. I had my pastor, who is very I'm very close with. The name is Joel. My pastor, Joel, asked me of these things, and I told him, you know what? This is getting to the point where it's ridiculous. It's assaulting my fiance. It's hurting us both. It's physically harming me. It's tormenting me. I need you here. I need you to come over. And he surprisingly said, all right, I'll come over after service. And he did. He came over. And when he walked in, he immediately said, whoa. Like instantly he felt it and we sat down and we talked about different experiences and eventually he got to the point where he's like, okay, 
if you want me to pray in different rooms in your house, pray different rooms in your house, let's do it. And I got up and he started in the bedroom and he prayed the, the prayer. I think it's Ephesians 6, 20 to 23. It's the whole armor of God one. And he said out loud, I, and he said out that loud, that verse. And when he got to the point where it said, so then put, put on the whole armor of God, I started to feel really heavy. The air around me got super heavy and it was hard for me to breathe. And I felt just like I did before, like something was holding my throat. He then proceeded to the bathroom, which is where my fiance had her experience. And there he did the prayer. It wasn't a direct verse. He more so did talking about Jesus on the cross and how his death was the end of everything. And that was it. And that was when I lost everything. I lost my sense of self and I ended up waking up on the couch. And when I woke up, I coughed and I didn't just cough, just like a cold cough, cold, but that type of thing. I coughed up blood and I was gasping for breath and I was drenched in sweat so much that I had to take off my shirt and it looked like I had ran a marathon and how sweaty I was, but I've never felt better. I've never felt that moment is the moment where I found true happiness, where I found the meaning to the reason to live. I found the reason to keep going. I found the rejuvenation of everything and I've never felt better. And that moment was the last time I ever felt that thing in my life. And that was months ago, and I felt nothing. Having something with you in your whole life, you could feel when it's there, and it's not there. It's gone. And the only thing I could attribute it to is the Word of God. Wow. Michael, I really appreciate you sharing these experiences on the show because you're bringing a level of reality to something that is not supposed to be real. And I really do appreciate you you opening up and being vulnerable to share these experiences because it can't be easy. These are very personal things you went through. And I really just want to say thank you for sharing that. And I thank you for having this platform to be able to share these experiences in an open forum that has no judgment because a weight is lifted off of me. And I feel like I've fulfilled my purpose through God to share these experiences, like I said, and have it where people know they're not alone. And the solidarity is so empowering for me. And the knowledge that I've gained, it's an incredible experience. And I can't thank you enough for having this be a show that I could come on and talk about these things. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I really hope that people listening to your story that might have experienced something that you did find peace that they're not alone. Whether you contact me to share your experience or not is irrelevant. But to know that you're not alone... And to hear Michael's story on how he got through it is something that I think anybody should pay attention to. Uh, So, Michael, thank you very much for coming on the show. Absolutely, Tony. It was a pleasure. All right. Well, thanks, Michael, for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. I know it can be very difficult to share such intimate things with an audience and stuff, but hopefully coming forward and sharing your experiences has helped you and your fiance get through some of these things. And speaking of your fiance, next up, we have Jessica coming on the show. So Jessica, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Tony. I'm glad you're here and I'm excited to hear some of your experiences. If I remember correctly, uh, I'm not sure if all your experiences, but I think some of your experiences actually were with Michael. Like they kind of, you were there when they were happening to him or something like that. Am I right? Correct. All right. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you start start off with uh, sharing with us some of these paranormal experiences that you've had and uh, feel free to share with us as much detail as you'd like. Um, I have some more uh, most recent ones that happened to us just the past couple of days, if I can share those with you, too. Uh, why don't you share with us 
the experiences that you had with Michael, uh, I know some of the experiences that he shared with me, you were there uh, in some way or form. Why don't you share your your right. side of the story with that and then transition into some of the newer stuff that happened recently? Sure. Well, there was a time when my pastor had come over and, um, you know, we felt there were bad spirits in our apartment and, you know, just wanted, we both felt like we were just kind of put under the gun, so to speak. And, you know, just things were getting a little too much out of control. And we just wanted him to come, you know, talk to us and feel out the apartment. And, you know, my pastor is very open-minded with everything. And, but he's, he seems to be very, not so convinced that there was something paranormal going on in our apartment. And as soon as he walked in, as soon as we opened the door to let him in, the second he stepped in the apartment, he go, he stopped and said, Oh, well, that's weird. Like he, you can just see in his face that he felt something before we even said anything to him. And we went from room to room, just praying over, um, each room that things happened in and um we got to the bathroom in the hallway of our bathroom and Michael started shaking and sweating and you know off balance and um I walked him over to the living area and where I had him sit down on the couch and my pastor was praying the whole time just not stop talking I'm just kind of whispering to Michael about you know, let's go, let's have you sit down. I don't want you to fall over. I don't want anything to happen to you. And so I had him sit down on the couch and my pastor is standing maybe like 10 feet away from Michael. And um, my pastor the whole time had his eyes closed, was praying and Michael's sitting there. And the more my pastor's praying, the more, you know, the spirits are just taking a hold of him and he's, like shaking back and forth, his eyes are like rolling back of his head and just sweating like I've never seen anybody sweat before, like he's running a marathon and you know, I'm trying to quietly um like snap him out of it, trying to get him to come to and you know, I just kept my eye I held his hand and I squeezed it tight just so he knew that I was there and as soon as my pastor said Amen, Michael came out of whatever um, trance that he was in the spirits finally gave up and he was coughing and he coughed up blood and you know didn't had no idea what was said what was going on where he was and it was scary because I thought that whatever was trying to get a hold of him had won and you know the I didn't want that to happen of course but it was just weird to see how quickly he went into it and how quickly he came out of it. So when you, when you were experiencing that with Michael and you saw him going through all that stuff, uh, what was your thoughts behind that? I mean, were you thinking that something was trying to kill him? Did you ever feel like he was going to die? Um, not that he was going to die because I have seen Michael walk through the, um, his faith and, you know, grow closer to God and stuff. And, um, I knew, I just had a weird gut feeling that, you know, he's not going to lose this battle and that things are going to be okay because he's surrounded by people that care about him and that, you know, my pastor will never let anything happen to him. And, you know, I just was hoping for the best. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, it, it's got to be a scary thing to see somebody that you love going through that. And uh, I imagine you did find comfort, though, that you weren't the only one there when that was happening, that, you know, the pastor was there. Uh, do you think that that whole situation kind of was spawned on because the pastor came over to handle business? Um, I actually don't, just because um, as bad as this, like, as that situation sound, I've had... I've experienced much worse um, in our, just in our apartment. We've had things, you know, happen at Michael's parents' house and my parents' house and in our apartment. But just we've had, just in our apartment, we've had much worse situations happen with 
spiritual activity and whatnot than that. So it was just kind of like, okay, this is happening. Just kind of same, same stuff, different day kind of mentality. Right. So uh, you met, just mentioned that, you know, it wasn't really, it, it sounds like you really weren't caught off guard a whole lot with this. It was just like, okay, here it goes, you know, and uh, you, but you mentioned that. Not really, just because it, it's happened, like I've seen it happen a lot. So it was just kind of, I knew what was happening, whereas like the first time it happened, I had no idea and it was really scary the first time. So just because I had been through it before i knew kind of what to expect or what was happening i got you makes sense so uh what are some of the other things that have been going on um you know well we have a little um key hook by the front door and we'll put our keys up on that key hook just you know so we don't misplace them or i'll set something down in a spot where i'll remember like on my nightstand or something really important, like my prayer list or my necklaces. And, you know, I swear that I put it there because that's like my routine thing is I put, you know, my prayer list goes on my nightstand at night. You know, my keys go on the key hook. And or I'll just get up, I'll put my phone, you know, on the couch and I'll go to the kitchen to get something to drink and I'll come back like two minutes later and, you know, it's gone. I have some felt really cushions and searched everywhere around the couch and you know then I'm like maybe I left in the bathroom and have gone through the whole apartment can't find it and you know I know that Michael wouldn't move my stuff or you know I wouldn't move his stuff just to you know make make each other mad and you know that wasn't the strangest spot where you find him it's like on my bed underneath the pillow underneath the sheets like I, places that we would never put things. Right. So, I mean, when it comes to things like that being moved around the apartment, uh, are how, what are your thoughts behind that? I mean, do you think that these things are physically moving to new locations by you know an unknown force, or do you think somehow they're being uh, teleported to new locations? Um, it depends on the situation. I have heard. Um, quite a few things in the apartment with Michael being in here and when he's been at work or when he's gone somewhere. Um, I hear I'll be in the bedroom and in the living area, I'll hear little kid, like a little boy and a little girl whispering, she's in the bedroom. And I hear a little giggling and little footsteps wow. like in the other room in the living area. And, you know, I don't say, I don't respond to them just because I, don't want to spook them if that makes sense i know that sounds really weird but i don't want to scare them off you know i work with kids so you know i understand that people may hear this and think that i should be more scared of them than they are of me but um it's just because it sounds like they're little kids that i don't and i work with kids that i don't want to spook them off and it's really interesting though They'll say, oh, the the girl is in the other room when I'm thinking I'm 24, I'm not a girl. And and the things that, you know, they're how they're describing me is just funny. Well, I mean, considering the dramatic experiences that Michael has had, um, do you ever get concerned that, you know, what you're what you think you're hearing isn't exactly, you know, accurate? I mean, uh, these things that Michael has dealt with are pretty, you know, dramatic. And uh, do you, so I'm, I'm asking basically, do you think that there are multiple types of entities in your apartment? There are. Like I said, um, I've heard screams. I've heard, you know, more threatening things. Like I've heard, I've had spirits tell me to get out. Michael has mentioned a woman standing over me, you know, stroking my back when I'm sleeping at night on my side of the bed. And he'll just, you know, put his arm around me and pull him, pull me closer to him at night because he's afraid of her hurting me. And then, you know, I obviously don't know what's going on because I'm sound asleep at that point. But, 
Um, I've had experiences. I've been in the bathtub and, you know, I'm just sitting there, you know, doing my own thing. And I've had a burning sensation like I've never felt before on my back. And I, you know, immediately, like, I screamed because it's scary because I'm in the bathroom by myself. I feel this burning sensation. And I run to Michael, and I've got three scratch marks from the top of my back to the bottom of my back. So I think it was just hearing younger spirits that I wasn't afraid. You know, I thought maybe I was trying to think of the best of things and you know, trying to keep an open mind. Outside of hearing those younger spirits, have you ever had anything else happen that leads you to believe that there are that, that there are younger spirits there? Um, I've only heard the, the little boy and the little girl. Um, I'm not sure if they're brother and sister, if they're related at all, but... Um, and the, the little footsteps, they hear little pitter-patter, little shoes running around every once in a while, but... Younger spirits, I've never heard anything else. I, I'm, I, in my mind, I think when I hear them multiple times, like over multiple periods of times, I think it's the same little boy and little girl just because sometimes I can hear them talking to each other and they sound like the same little boy and little girl. Okay. So you guys, I, I'm, I'm correct in saying that you guys live in an apartment right now, right? Correct. Okay. So you have this apartment that you're living in. Is this the kind of apartment that's like an apartment complex or is this an apartment where it was a house made into apartments? Um, it's an apartment complex. Okay. Are you familiar with your neighbors at all? Do they have any experiences themselves? Do you know of? Um, we're not really familiar with our neighbors. We've had quite a few um, people move in and out next door to us and above us, but we have talked to you know, some of the people in the building and they haven't heard anything or felt anything. Um, Michael has talked to one of the guys that works here and he said there are spirits that he feels are on the property, but not specifically in the building that we live in. So for him to, like when I heard him say that, it was just kind of a surprise, like, oh, this is the first, like he's, Never heard of anybody that's lived in this building say that they've experienced paranormal activity. Well, I mean, the idea of them being on the property but not in the buildings, um, can you kind of throw out the wind window with your experiences? Uh, they're clearly inside your apartment, and I would imagine if um, there are spirits in general on the property and they're, you know, uh, inhabiting your apartment, I imagine that they venture through walls at times, uh, whether you guys know about other people's experiences yeah. or not. Um, have you ever had experiences like this before you met Michael? I have not. Okay, so you can thank Michael for not all these experiences. Not one at all. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, always, I'm always telling him whether it's a good experience or a bad experience. I'm like, I blame you for this. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, he he should have uh, put you know like a prereq on the relationship. Like, here's the things you're going to be getting involved in before you, <laughs> you know, you know, because he wanted to make sure that you, yeah. you were totally filled in. But um, so you guys have a but lot. I'm of, not scared off. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you didn't get scared off with him uh, informing you, uh, then you're a keeper, right? So, but clearly you're a keeper because you guys are engaged. So, um, with the experiences yeah. that you had in the apartment and stuff, is this something that you think is going to carry on uh, when you guys move to another location? Um, I'm not, well, I can just say this. I've been to Michael's parents' house, like when he lived at home and it's happened there. I feel like there's more positive experiences in our apartment than there were, you know, when I spent the night at his parents' house. So it's kind of a relief that there's more positive than negative in our apartment. I think it's just the atmosphere. Michael and I are pretty positive people. And, you know, we try to think the best of things. Whereas um, at his parents' house, there's lots of negativity and just it's not a place you are thrilled to go to, per se. I got you. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, so you're in the apartment. 
What's the most recent experience you had there? Um, just the other day, I was sitting um, in my apartment in the living area, and I think Michael was at a men's event at our church, and I heard a female voice coming, and I didn't know if it was like, because at, at first, I always think like, is it something outside? Is there someone out there? Like, I always think, is it a real person? Is someone in passing? And I wait a few minutes and I heard it in closer into my apartment. And I saw this lady, she was in a white dress. She had a cast, like a uh, ace bandage on her leg. And she was moving from our kitchen to the front door, just humming. And she, it didn't sound anything bad. It wasn't like I was threatened by it or scared off by it. It was just a lady humming. I don't know if she was lost, if she was trying to find someone or trying to find somewhere to go. You know, I said hi to her and she waved at me and then she was gone. So she actually, you actually acknowledged it and she acknowledged you back. Uh-huh. Wow. Do you think, do you think that's just, <laughs> I just, it's not normal. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, just because my, my way of thinking is that, um, I know this sounds really bad, but it, I'm turning into a positive that people don't always, you know, acknowledge me when I say hi to them, like real people. And, you know, people make me feel bad a lot and I don't like the way it, it makes me, me feel myself. So I always try to, you know, do well onto others. You know, I always give people the benefit of the doubt and I always say hi to people and I'm always trying to encourage people. So I said hi to her because I know that if it was, you know, anybody else and it was me, you know, no one would say hi to me. And so I thought maybe if I say hi to her that she would talk to me and, you know, she waved at me and then she smiled and she left. So you have a very different philosophy than some people when it comes to this. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that uh, react to things the way you just said. But uh, I mean, certainly I, I, I wouldn't react that way. Um, and uh, you treat them as if they're, you know, people like uh, like you saw me out in the street and you say hello to me. Um, and I, I find that interesting. Uh, yeah. Do you have any desire to end this stuff in the apartment? The positives or the negatives well i don't mind either one i don't really mind the positives you know it's kind of fun like i said listening to the little girl and little boy talking and stuff the negatives we definitely just because of how bad it got to the point where i not just mike like michael would wake up with scratches on his arms and you know he would be thrown off the bed and things like that. But once it got to me, Michael put his foot down and, you know, when Michael told our pastor before he came over, he's like, oh, this is hurting her too. He's like, yeah, this, this is not okay. I need to come over and see what's up and see what's going on. All right. I, I just, I find it interesting because I mean, so you basically you're saying is uh, you would love for the negative stuff to stop, but the positive stuff, you could go either way. If, I mean, let me ask you this. Yeah, it seems like you you approach this in a different way than uh, many people. Um, if the positive stopped along with the negative, say you got the negative stop, but also the positive then stopped as well, how would you feel? Would you feel like you miss these positive experiences? A little bit, yeah. I would be a little bit sad. You know, it would it wouldn't be, you know, a big loss for me, but. And it doesn't happen that often either. You know, we don't have encounters every single day and like every hour. But when it does happen, it's kind of, it's, you know, you laugh at it. You're like, that was funny. That was random. And it's always like, well, most of the time for me, speaking for myself, it's always when I'm, you know, going through something, when I'm having a hard, hard time, when I'm going through a hard time or having a bad day that I always hear those little kids running around. And it always, you know, brightens up my day and it makes me laugh. Because they never referred to me as like, oh, that, that lady or, you know, Jess or Jessica. It's always, she's, she's in there again. You know, she, she better not make her mad. She's going to make a sleeve. And that's always, 
things that I would never do. I would never kick kids out of my apartment or, you know, chase them off and scare them. And that's why I kind of like the positive um, spirits because I feel like I'm helping them and I'm watching over them too. Well, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, I, I appreciate your point of view. I really do. Um, you know, I, I didn't really expect you to uh, have that su- such a positive outlook on some of these things just because uh, hearing some of Michael's stories and stuff, I knew that um, obviously there was a lot of uh, deep negative affection towards him and, um, or I should say infliction towards him. And uh, I was under the assumption when we were going to talk that you uh, we're going to kind of mirror it, but you kind of go both ways where, you know, with the positive, the negative, and it sounds like Michael was kind of walking in step with you on that. So I find that very interesting, Jessica. I really do. Um, but, uh, before we get out of here, uh, what are your thoughts on the things going on in your apartment as far as the negative and positive? Do you think that these are different types of entities or do you think that they're all different? pretty much the same type of entity and entity, but they're reacting to you differently. Um, I think that they're different because just, you know, if something negative happens to Michael, I tend to, before he even tells me specifically, he goes into details on what happened. I, you know, approach him on, did you feel that last night or did you hear that noise or, you know, was the cat acting different and, you know, he'll be like, yeah, I was going to ask you that, but I just thought it was me and I didn't think that you would experience that too. And it's also the animals. We have fish, we have a lizard, and we have a cat. The cat really, you know, stands up for the negative. You know, she really protects us and she's like a guard dog, but she's a cat. Um, you know, Michael has been sleeping and um, I've been woken up by really negative spirits and stuff. And, you know, I'm like, did I, was I dreaming? Was, you know, did I, was did it really happen? And, you know, I wake up completely scared out of my wits and she'll be growling. She'll look at like, let's say the closet door and she'll just sit there and growl. And as soon as I feel it go away, she stops growling and she'll like go back to sleep. I got you. I got you. Uh, well, Jessica, I'll tell you what, thanks for uh, sharing some of these experiences and stuff. And I'm glad that um, you and Michael uh, get along so well with this stuff. I mean, I know sometimes it could be a, a relationship killer, but it definitely seems like you guys are walking in step with this. And I think that's encouraging. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, email. I don't care how you share the show. Just share the show. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first, it'll piss you off. Bye.